Welcome to Strip Cover Loop, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for a video which will take place in two separate playlists here on the channel. Number one, obviously, being the opening paragraph, opening paragraph playlist here on the channel. Uh, but number two, a conclusion video for the read-along for The Haunting or The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This video is a long time coming because when opening paragraphs come to my mind, The Haunting or The Haunting of Hill House basically the first thing that pops up <clears throat> such a phenomenal opening paragraph uh, and the opening paragraph itself reads as such no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream hill house not sane stood by itself against its hills holding darkness within it had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. Ah, damn, that's a good paragraph. I'm going to read it again because it's so good. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. I am not alone. Uh, in the uh, conclusion that this is one of the finest opening paragraphs that English literature has yet produced, um, someone who agrees with me, or someone with whom I agree, perhaps, considering I read this book before I read... Uh, Haunting of Hill House, Stephen King, and in Dance Macabre, on page 282, he says this of the opening paragraph to The Haunting. I think there are few, if any, descriptive paragraphs in the English language uh, that are any finer than this. It is the sort of quiet epiphany every writer hopes for, words that somehow transcend words, words which add up to a total greater than the sum of the parts. Analysis of such a paragraph is mean and shoddy, is a mean and sh analysis of such a paragraph is a mean and shoddy trick and should almost always be left to college and university professors, those lepidarists of literature who, when they see a lovely butterfly, feel they should immediately uh, they should immediately run into the field with a net, catch it, kill it with a drop of chloroform and mount it on a whiteboard and put it under a glass case where it is still beautiful and just as dead as horse shit. Having said that, let us analyze this paragraph a bit. I promise not to kill it or mount it. However, I have neither the skill nor the inclination, but show me any graduate thesis in the field of English American literature and I will show you a mess of dead butterflies, most of them killed messily and mounted inter inexpertly. We'll just, sum we'll just stun it for a moment or two, and then let it fly on. All I really want to do is point out how many things this single paragraph does. It begins by suggesting that Hill House is a living organism, tells us that this live organism does not exist under conditions of absolute reality, that because... Although here I should add that I may be making an in induction Miss Jackson did not intend, it does not dream. It is not sane. The paragraph tells us how long its history has been, immediately establishing that historical context that is so important to the haunted house story, and it concludes by telling us that something walks in the rooms and halls of Hill House. All of this in two sentences. Jackson introduces an even more unsettling idea by implicating, by implication. She suggests that Hill House looks all right on the surface. It is not the creepy old Marston place from Salem's Lot, which 
uh, with its boarded up windows, mangy roof and peeling walls. It's not the tumble down brooding place that at the ends of those day in, dead end streets, those places where children throw rocks by daylight and fear to venture after dark, Hill House is looking pretty good. But then, Norman Bates was looking pretty good too, at least on the surface. There are no drafts in Hill House, but it, and those foolish enough to go there, we presume, does not exist under conditions of absolute reality. Therefore, it does not dream. Therefore, it is not sane. And apparently, it kills. If Shirley Jackson presents us with a history, a sort of supernatural provenance as a starting point, um, oh, yeah, that's too far. That goes into the next point. Uh, but that comes to us from Stephen King. If anybody knows anything about uh, the horror genre, it's probably the guy who sold more books than God. Um, now, two things mentioned therein. Uh, number one, that such a paragraph should never be uh, torn apart, should never be uh, excruciatingly examined. But here, fuck Stephen King. We're going to do that. Uh, number two, he mentions the idea of implication. And we're going to get back to that in a second. Just keep that in mind. Implication. Implied. Something being implied. Not stated, but implied. Um, I just have to take a second to marvel in the greatness that is this opening paragraph. Now, to marvel at the greatness that is this opening paragraph, like Stephen King says, it is the sum of more than its part, because that very first sentence, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality, even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. What does that even mean? No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality? No live organism? Sanely? Okay, well, what, what does sane mean? What are you classifying as a live organism, especially when you're going from this into the characterization of a house? Absolute reality? What does that mean? Continue under uh, conditions of absolute reality? We all exist in absolute reality, we, you, but you're pointing to this nefarious sort of ethereal dream world that takes us out. Um, by saying that even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Okay, well, that doesn't really say anything. But goddamn, does it sound good. No live organism. Um, so the, the opening sentence here, um, it's spooky. It is spooky and it is sort of, like I said, ethereal. But it uses pretty concrete terms. Absolute reality. Well, we know what absolute means, and we know what reality is, but when you put the two together, it's sort of hard to put your finger on. Um, when we're looking at this, a lot of what is spooky about it is about what is inferred. Um... When you, in, when you say no live organism, you're inferring dead. When you say sanely, you infer insanely. You infer insanity. When you say absolute reality, you infer sort of the opposite, whatever the opposite of absolute reality is. Uh, when you say dream... I think it would be possible to argue that when you're opening a horror novel, a book called The Haunting, when you say dream, you infer nightmare. Now, there are two different sort of lanes down which we can go with this. And I think uh, it is necessary to start with that second sentence to choose which lane we're going to go down first. Hill House not sane. To say something is not sane is not to say that it's insane. Um, we are sort of using what is called um, apophysis. 
A-P-O-P-H-A-S-I-S, -S, um, which is when you bring up a subject by denying it. Look, I'm not going to say O.J. Simpson was a murderer. What is that doing? That is letting you know, oh yeah, well, O.J. Simpson was a murderer, wasn't he? Look, I'm not going to say uh, Bill Clinton was morally abject. What is that saying? What am I doing there? I'm just bringing up morality in Bill Clinton for no reason at all. I mean, you know, I didn't say that. That's a uh, apophysis. Hill House, not saying. I'm not saying it's insane. I'm not saying it's absolutely mad. I'm not saying that. Um, but you are. You are by not saying it. But there's another direction for which this can go. Um, and oddly enough, it's something which was concentrated on very heavily in the 60s by Jacques Derrida. Uh, I say very strangely enough because Hill House was published in 1959. But oftentimes, um, ideas like this Look, you obviously can't say that Shirley Jackson nicked this off of uh, Jacques Derrida. Did Jacques Derrida read The Haunting of Hill House and sort of realize some of these things? Probably doubtable. But <clears throat> the idea is a term within the deconstructionalist school of thought known as trace. And I'm going to read this to you straight from the hallowed walls of Wikipedia. In French, the word trace has a range of meanings similar to those of its English equivalent, but also suggests meanings related to the English words track, path, or mark. In the preface to her translation of, of grammatology, uh, Gayardi Chakravorty Spivak, I, I don't know this name, this is the first time I'm saying this, wrote, I stick to trace in my translation because it looks the same as Derrida's word. The reader must remind himself of at least the track, even the spoor, which contain within the French word. Because of the meaning of a sign is generated from the difference it has from other signs, especially the other half of its binary pairs, the sign itself contains a trace of what it does not mean i.e. bringing up the concepts of a woman, normality, or speech may simultaneously evoke the concepts of man, abnormality, or writing. Derrida does not positively or strictly define trace and, de and denies the possibility of such a project. Indeed, words like difference, arc writing, pharmacos, and especially specter carry similar meanings in many other texts by Derrida. His refusal to apply only one name to his concepts is a deliberate strategy to avoid a set of metaphysical assumptions that he argues have been central to the history of European thought. Trace can be seen as an always contingent term for a mark of absence of presence, an always already absent present of the originary lack that seems to be the condition of thought and experience. Trace is a contingent upon the critique of a language always already present. Language bears within itself the necessity of its own critique. Deconstruction, unlike analysis or interpretation, tries to lay the inner contradictions, lay the inter inner contradictions of a text bare and in turn build a different meaning from that. It is at once a process of deconstruction and construction. Derrida claims that these contradictions are neither accidental nor exceptions. They are the exposure of certain, quote, metaphysics of pure presence, end quote, an exposure of the transcendental signified, always already hidden inside, lang inside language. This always already hidden contradiction is trace. These things in mind, these ideas at play, the idea that by mentioning something, you're inferring its opposite, and the idea that to, the idea of apophysis, to mention something in order to just plant the seed. Let's read this opening paragraph one more time with those things at play. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. 
Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. So I think if, if we are inferring all of the opposites here, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, no live organism, dead stuff. Can continue long to exist sanely, exist for a very long time in an insane manner, under conditions of absolute reality, in some dream world. Even Lars and Katie did. I think there's something to be done there. Uh, the opposite of a lark might be a crow, because you're looking at the symbology behind the two uh, larks, meaning we'll get into it later, but pureness, uh, crows being sort of um, mental, uh, Katie dids. I, I think colloquially what you're doing there, Katie dids, here in the Midwest, a Katie did, a cicada, a uh, locust, it's all the same shit. We don't really care. It's, it's a, a Katie did, a locust, a cicada. You can call it all the same thing. Shirley Jackson deals a lot with colloquialisms. Shirley Jackson challenges colloquialisms a lot. Uh, so when triggering the Katie did, uh, you might be inferring the locust. Uh, locust, not a great thing. Uh, especially when you're looking at literature. Especially when you're looking at literature that might be pointing towards the Bible. Um, supposed by some to dream. Are supposed by some to have to be nightmares. Hill House not sane. Hill House insane. Stood by itself. Stood among what? Uh, against hills. Against depressions. Uh, holding darkness within. The light without, dark within. Uh, so you're doing a lot of things here. When you get down to the construction, upright bricks met neatly. Um, here's the one that gets me. The doors were sensibly shut. The fuck does it mean to be sensibly shut? By whose sense and sensibilities? Shut? Why shouldn't the door be open? And if it is open, does that mean it's askew in some manner that is not just? Does that mean that it is askew in some manner that is loco? Um, whatever walked there walked alone. Well, we're obviously going to incite that because here within the story, it won't be walking alone. It will be walking whatever it is. Assuming there is a something, we're saying there's a something, right? Assuming there is a something, we'll be walking with the characters to our story. Um, along these lines... Oh, so, um, with apophysis, one of the things that you're also doing there is you're inferring degree, right? So if I were to write, because we don't have a visual, because writing is, is the visual that we get, our eyes are on the page, which means this thing has to be cranking um, in order to generate some visual on its own of the story taking place because that is the case if I were to say something like I wouldn't call it blue I wouldn't call it green means yeah it's blue or yeah it's green but it's maybe not pinpoint blue or pinpoint green Hill House not saying are we saying it's insane or are we saying that there is some measure of sanity there and if there is uh, some implied measure of sanity, as we will see later in the text, if there is some implied measure of sanity to things, as we will see through our characters, uh, namely our main character, if there is some measure to sanity, then none of us might be quite sane. Right? If it's not blue, I wouldn't call it blue. That means we're putting it somewhere on the spectrum of blue, but it's not pinpoint blue. If it's not sane, I wouldn't say it's sane. Then we're admitting that sane is a pinpoint spot. And the rest of us might not be quite on the mark. Um, when we look at Lark's and Katie Dibs. 
Larks sing in the morning, katydids more prominent at night. So we've got an idea of opposites there. Larks are, so what we're doing is, we're setting the ends of sleep. Larks might wake you up. Katydids might be, as you're going, you might hear them as you're heading to bed. So what we're doing is we are demarcating the hours of sleep. The hours of sleep being when sanity, we're implying here, is not quite measured. Absolute reality is not there in the dream world. That's what we're saying here. Larks might wake you up. Katie Dids might play you to sleep. In the in-between time, you are forced under absolute reality. Meaning that everything that we are seeing in this text in assuming that it happens to people while they're awake is happening under absolute reality um larks a lark is a word as well as a bird it is a noun a merry or carefree adventure in the symbolism a lark is a uh it's purity. It's a pretty thing. The larks play you to play wake you up. Not like not like a not like a not like a cockadoodle do, right? You're talking about something that is a pretty song returning. We hear the larks. Even in the midst of war, the larks were seen as a sign of good fortune. Katie did not as much. Again, I mentioned that colloquially, here in the Midwest. Katie did, locust, cicada, it's all the same shit. You say one, you, you might mean any of the three. Uh, you mean any of the three, you might say one of the others. This is something that Shirley Jackson challenges in her writing a lot, colloquialism. You know the thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that thing, that thing that we talk about, that thing. Colloquially. Shirley Jackson does not like the power of colloquialism. Shirley Jackson hates the power of of the colloquial. The colloquial is the assumed. The colloquial is the good old boys club. The colloquial is what is, has always been, and might as well always be. Why? Because it works plenty enough, right? Uh, that is something that Shirley Jackson railed against in her writing. Um, but in assuming that Katie did equals cicada equals locust, Katie did equals pestilence. That's one of the seven plagues of the Bible. Um, you're looking at something which is lark being the very pretty sign and Katie did's not really being that being sort of the opposite um, then we have numerology a little bit to work in as far as I can tell as far as I can see the number 80 in numerology means the mundane means also ran, means regular. Hill House stood for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. So that's sort of contradictory, isn't it? If what I'm researching 80 to mean, what I can find 80 to mean is actually what 80 means in numerology, and any time a writer mentions a specific name, it's at least worth looking into. If 80 means the also ran, if 80 means the regular, well, how are we supposed to take that when we're talking about Hill House? Well, we maybe already had one biblical reference with the Katydids. Is it possible that 80 is another biblical reference? Is it possible that 80 is thrown in because Moses was 80 when he challenged the Pharaoh? Our main character here challenges a very um, archetypal role in her life, a very archetypal character in her own life at the outset of this story. So that 80 might be mentioned in order to represent rebellion, to represent the fact that something is being challenged. Um, but also, I think if we're talking about colloquial, when you talk about 80 years, it's a lifespan. Now, it's not life expectancy. Life expectancy, I think, right now is 76. 
in the 50s, I think, was closer to the realm of 70, um, if not late 60s. But when you're talking about a lifespan, well, Hill House has already been around for an entire lifespan, and it might live for an entire lifespan more. Here's an odd thing when we're thinking about it in those terms, isn't it? No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Okay? Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. No live organism can continue to live... No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Hill House, not sane, that suggests not only that Hill House does exist under terms of absolute reality, but that Hill House itself is alive. Hill House itself is living. No live organism. Why would you start with live organisms? Only to suggest that Hill House is itself a live organism. But it is not sane. That is one of those weird little quirks that Shirley Jackson is so good at slipping in. You suggest A and you suggest B and you say not A. Well, that means that B is true. Here it's suggest A, suggest B, say it's not B. That suggests that A is true. No live organism can continue to exist sanely. Hill House not sane is live. I could talk for an hour just on the opening paragraph to Hill House. Um, it's so good and it wraps into the story so well and it really wraps up the story so well. When you get to the end of this thing, um, it is, you realize how much you really got in the beginning there. So I'm not gonna read you the last paragraph from the book, but it's worth looking at. That is all I have for this um, opening paragraph video. I have new videos on the channel, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mondays are for poetry. I also have uh, new videos on my personal channel from time to time, a link to which can be found in the description below. I hope to see you here next time, and I also hope to see you over there uh, because I'm trying to uh, expand out a little bit.